Batman has a problem. He's only attracted to bad girls. And the Catwoman is the perfect foil for him in that regard. She has a great relationship with Bruce Wayne and Batman. You know, and you can't do that with, obviously, you can't do that with any other villain. She's the opposite image of Batman. I wanted to create a female villain because most of the villains prior to that time were males. So I created Catwoman in the image of a woman to, for a female audience. So that way we would grab the, the male audience and the female audience. Well, the key thing I always remember about her is that when she first showed up, she didn't have the costume. She didn't have any costume. She was this beautiful brunette dressed up in like a green dress or something, but nothing flamboyant or super heroine or villainous. It would be uh, another appearance or two before she would have like the cat mask, which would be more like an actual cat head on top of her before she would finally have the stylized look that we would come to recognize as sort of the purple and green caped version that would last for a good, I would say 40 years of the character's comic history. With uh, Catwoman, the filmmakers really had to reinvent the character. You wanted to have somebody who was caught between the two worlds of Batman and the Penguin and Oswald and Bruce. So what better way to show that than a character who is in somewhat in conflict with herself, who goes from being a very mousy, put-upon woman who comes back to avenge the, the crime that was done to her. Selena, Selena. <laughs> That's my name, Maximilians. Don't wear it out or I'll make you buy me a new one. The DC version of Catwoman and the TV version of Catwoman, she was much tougher, you know, openly, like, aggressive female from the get-go. And, like, all she did was throw on a costume. And to me, that wasn't interesting. And just, you know, saying, okay, this is the way it was there, now I'm going to do it that way, too. It was completely uninteresting to me. And I was willing to, like, you know, quote-unquote, lose the job. That was my take. To really start her off as, like, kind of a lowly secretary... You know, I love in the fact that in in the film that Michelle Pfeiffer doesn't even have a close up until like 20 minutes in the movie. That she's kind of in the background of scenes and like you don't really see her. That I that I wanted that that it was this you know this woman that starts off alone and becomes about empowerment and it goes beyond feminism into something creepy and feminine, like something scary and dark. So I really felt like I was giving this a twist in a good way. Hey, stud. I thought we had something together. Michelle Pfeiffer as Catwoman is awesome. She was um, kind of slinky and kind of vampy and, and in a kind of campy, kind of Julie Newmar way, but still she had like a real underlying psychotic edge to her. You know, you, you knew at any moment she could really, you know, really go off and do somebody some, some real harm. It's one of my favorite performances of anything I've been around, you know. For the most part, I really approached it from the standpoint of the psychology of, of the character and, and this dual personality and what that meant and everything really springing from that. Sometimes her sexuality will come out of a manipulation, sometimes it will come out of a playfulness, and sometimes it'll be very real. And we didn't exactly know where those moments were going to be. And then after a while it just kind of took on a life of its own, and it became obvious where it had to be. Catwoman is best described as an anti-hero because she's not a villainous in the most diabolical of senses. She's not a murderess. She's not about gaining vengeance for any particular thing. She's basically about kind of the anarchy of stealing from the man in a way. That's the thing that's always been intriguing about this part. People come up to me now and they say, now, is she a good guy or is she a bad guy? And they're confused because it was always left very ambiguous. And I always liked that. I always liked that they just l let it be that. <laughs> He's an industrialist. Uh, he, among other things, has met, uh, Shrek's department store. Originally, the Max Shrek character, he is the golden boy son of the Cobblepots, and it turns out that he and Penguin are brothers, and there was that kind of dichotomy in the movie of, like, the, the saintly brother who runs the city and the ultimate black sheep who's thrown in the sewer and how they come up together. But the script and the movie is way too rich to begin with, and that was just another layer that we finally had to lose. When I suggested to Tim, I, I thought of Christopher Walken, and Tim, who loves ghouls and skeletons and odd things, said, oh, no, he said, he's, he's, I'm afraid of him. He scares me. And I said, but Tim, you're supposed to be afraid of Max Shrek. 
They made up a fictional character that's not in Batman's universe, and suddenly he becomes the most exciting character in the film? Well, sorry, but that's what you get when you put Christopher Walken in a role. He says uh, there's no such thing as too much power. He says that's, that's what his life is about. Now, that's, uh, those are actually his lines. I think he means it. Bottom line, she tries to blackmail me. I'll drop her out a higher window. Meantime, I got better fish to fry. I think Max probably didn't have a lot of education and that he sort of made his own way, you know. What's the deal, Mr. Shrek? Is the Penguin a personal friend? Yes, he's a personal friend of this whole city, so have a heart. Give the Constitution a rest that there's Christmas. I think that Max and the Penguin, for their own reasons, enjoy each other's company. Probably because when you're like that, there aren't that many people you can talk to.